I'm glad to be here. It's an honor, and I know that uh, you're all students, and you got you got time pressures and all that kind of thing. So I'm here to sort of share my life story, and then also give you some insight into what I learned over. I've been had my own business, and it started in 1984, so that's over 30 years ago, and uh, it was successful. And then I've had some failures since then, and uh, you know. I've learned a lot from those, I hope. I'm still learning, so, and I hope we can learn from you, and I've talked to Thomas about doing some mentoring, so. Um, I was just gonna quickly run through like the history of this business that I had, and uh, you know, one of the first questions we, I always talk, when we talk about you know, having your own business is like, you know, what, what's the first thing you have to have to have a business? You gotta have this, this thing, otherwise the rest of it won't happen. Do, what's the first word that pops into your mind? Idea. Idea? Passion. Passion's good important. Drive. Drive, good stuff. Money. Very important. We're going to talk about that. <laughs> Who said that in the back? This the guy. The, yeah. Okay, that's good. I, I didn't see where you came from. I'm sorry. You have to have all those things. Well, you're not in business, and you could have all those things, but still not be in business. And so, what what is the thing you have to have to be in business? You could have money. You could have an idea. You could have passion. You could have drive. But you could be just sitting around. Customer. Customer. All right. What's your name? Travis. Travis. Let's give Travis a hand. So. <laughs> Until you have a customer, you don't have a business. You got an idea. You have a bu people say, I need a business plan. You know, back when I first started, people said, I need a computer or whatever. I need a patent. The customer, by definition, is a person or an entity that freely places the value of what you do to the point where they're willing to pay for it. And until you have a customer, you don't have a business. And there's a lot of non-business businesses out there. By that meaning, they got an idea. They got a passion. They got to have VC money. They might have, uh, you know, a fancy logo, right? But they don't have a business because they don't have a customer. So we're gonna central this, in, in the relationship with the customer is your most important asset. And that's what Thomas and I, have. we've got a relationship that goes back a long time. So I'll show you the story I grew up, how I grew up and how this, some of these self-evident truths be, became imbued in me. So one of the things that I, I've, uh, I miss actually, but the, in retrospect, looking back on my life and what in the business part was this, this idea of tribe, okay? And, Tribe to me means different things to different people, but in this case, when, I'm, when I use the word tribe, I mean people that number one, they self-select in a lot of times. You know, you might be born into a tribe, but you have, we have a sort of a moral code that we, we have amongst each other, you know? I know some of these special forces here, you guys have that tribe thing big time, right? And then military is a big part of the tribe or when you're part of a university department. Um, and then of course, you know, you, you cover each other and then you help each other and there's a synergy of like, this guy or that gal or whatever has brings a skill or knowledge or something to the or to the tribe, you know we need somebody that can sharpen a bow and arrow, right? And you need someone else to start a fire. We need a witch doctor, and uh, so and it turns out with a tribe though, you know you need a leader, and, and it turns out that a lot of times the tribal leader, and especially in a business, you almost have to be able to do everything. So I'm going to show you this. I mean, I I could do everything. I did everything, including you know designing the logo and getting the money and delivering. But uh, so I, I grew up as a fascinated with gases as a kid. I mean, the idea of gases is, is uh, kind of a weird thing, but it turns out that everything you see that's manufactured is manufactured with gas in some way, you know, whether it's nitrogen, ar oxygen, argon, krypton, zelium, helium. And uh, so, you know, just seeing LED light, those are, excuse me, those are uh, neon lights in Chicago. So in terms of the tribe, you know, again, we talked about, you talked about passion, so I'm going to talk about that, and there's the people that are in the tribe, Right? We got to be very careful about it. You've heard that, that, that standard thing, you know, where's the bus going? Who's on the bus? And what seats do they have? And who do, has to get off the bus? Right? This is a super important thing. And I, I, uh, it took me a long time to, to, to discern this, to be able to be better at deciding who's on the tribe, who's on, on board. And then we have a purpose that we share. And the idea being there, like, what's, what's our raison d'etre? What's, what's the central value proposition that we bring to our customers? And we have to share that. But all these things, you have to have all these things. Um, so, you know, in terms of passion, somebody said passion first. I don't know who it was. You did, right. Great. I mean, that's, that's where it starts. I mean, this is, I mean, either you're getting good instruction here or something. But, I mean, if somebody just said, yeah, I need a patent, you know, uh, passion and because at the end of the day, if you're gonna have your, I think, does everybody in this room wanna have their own businesses? Is that why we're all here? Okay, well, if you don't have passion, there's gonna be some pretty rough days out there. Um, you know, then there's other things that happen to you, you know, like your family experiences, your education, and your work. Um, 
you know, I grew up in a family that had a business, and my father worked six days a week, and we had nine kids, I'll show you that. And, um, you know, then you get your education that goes along with that, and we tend to seek stuff in education that, that, that inspires us. And I met this guy, Hugh Smith, I'll never forget it. You know, have these, you have these experiences in your life, you meet a person, and your life, you go, holy smoke, you know, smacked upside the head, and you say, I just learned something that I, that's, it's a truth that I didn't know. And so I wanted to start my own business. I'd been working for other people for a number of years, worked for Boeing, and I'll show you, I'm an engineer. And um, I met Hugh, and he said, well, you know, if you want to have your own business, you got a briefcase, you got a tie on, you look like you could be a salesman. I said, yeah, I'm, a, I'm an industrial, I mean, industrial sales was my background. And he said, well, well what's the, what's, tell me the two things you know the most about. And I said, well, you know, I'm thinking, well, where does this fit in? And he said, well, I know about gases, because I'd worked in the industrial gas business. I knew about engines, because I'd worked you know, for an engine development company. They kind of tie together combustion and heat transfer. And what he said was that <clears throat> the thing you know the most about is the thing you should go into. Because that's the thing you have the passion for. You know, I met a guy that wanted, was like selling financial services. He says, yeah, I do it, but you know, it's good money for doing mortgage brokering and all that. And he said, but he said, I don't really love it. And he said, I want to have my own business. And I said, well, what, what do you love? He says, I love fly fishing. I said, well, fabulous. Go, go over to Orvis over on Bash, you know, Bainbridge Island or go to, you know, whoever else makes these fly rods and get into fly rod business or get into, get, get into business which you love doing. And then it's not so much work because what happens is that, you know, you're going to be, if you're grinding up against something and you don't really enjoy it, if you don't have a passion for it, you know, the, the rest of it's not going to work. So starting with passion, but the passion is the thing you know the most about. So you look at yourself and you say, well, I know the most about flag design or whatever it might be. There's a business to be had there if you have a passion for it. There's always space, there's always a niche, an area you have a passion for. Even buggy whips, you could probably, there's probably a buggy whip business out there. You remember they all talk about the buggy whips? So, you know, and then the other thing about, you know, passion is in being young and being inexperienced is that, you know, there's the gift of being a beginner because you don't know what you don't know. You know, like there's this, Richard Feynman talks about the three types of knowledge, right? Like, you know, I know the molecular weight of helium. I don't know Sanskrit, but I know there's a language called Sanskrit out there. And then there's the other stuff that, like, you know, it's just mystery, right? It's just, like, the unknown unknowns they talk about. And these are the things where there's a lot of opportunity for us as, as individuals, and there are also the things that come up and bite you right in the backside when you don't expect it. So it's that unknown unknowns. But if, as a beginner, you know, you, you say to yourself, well, I, you know, you just sort of damn the torpedoes and start ahead. You don't know what can't be done. Right? A two-year-old doesn't know what can't be done. We learned how what can't be done over time. So my father and mother uh, married during the war, and uh, my dad was a boxer, my mom was a cheerleader, that kind of thing, you know. And uh, but he, my grandfather, started a business in 1933 selling milk. He was in the tire business and, and went uh, didn't go bankrupt. But 1933, people weren't buying gasoline; they weren't getting their tires fixed. And so he, got, he saw a woman go into a store. She spent her last 12 cents on a, a quart of milk for her baby. And she was threadbare, you know, just barely had clothes. And he said, we're going into the milk business because people will never let their children st uh, starve. And so he got in the milk business. My father ended up 1946 taking over. It's, it's my, me and my dad. He was a great guy. And we had a big family. Uh, this brother ended up running the business. And I had another brother that's not in the picture ended up being in the business. And, my dad, this is me here, my dad died when he was 57. I was, uh, you know, my class was a real diverse class. I just happened to go to a school, like, you don't see this, and you didn't see that much when, when, when you were a kid, and that's where I grew up. And uh, I, this was a really good experience. And I had, this guy right here was a, a super nerd. <laughs> and I, we were building radios, you know, and making hydrogen in the basement one time. I remember one time I had a, you know, those, like zinc and copper with a battery between them and, you know, these two bubbling, uh, Flasks, and one was filled with, uh, filled at twice the rate as the other. And I couldn't remember, like, well, which one's hydrogen, which one's oxygen, you know? So I said, hey, Dougie, let's just light a, let's just light a match under each and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> so it was this guy here, and his father was a chemi chemical engineer, so he, you know, we, he sort of got the, got the, the glass stuff from his father. We're down there with a car battery. You can imagine, my mother's upstairs, Danny, what are you doing? Oh, we're making hydrogen in the basement. Nope. Good, honey, good, good. And so, uh, I take this, this hydrogen flask, and you know we knew the gas was probably lighter, and I, I lit the match under there, and this blue flame whoosh, shots out across the room, and this flask takes off like a rocket the other way. 
He goes, <laughs> breaks into a million pieces. My mother goes, is everything okay? Yeah, I just dropped the flask, mom. Okay, happy. <laughs> you know, so, you know, these are things that happen as a kid. And then you start to think, man, there's a lot of power in that hydrogen. You know? So I played football. And being part of a team, you know, I was a team guy. You know, I was never really very, I was kind of small and stuff. But I played quarterback. This is me. And a uh, great coach, you know, just had a, he re this guy Jack Castle was one of my mentors, and he taught us the importance of team. You know, you learn some of these things early, you know. And he played everybody. We didn't win every game, but we, we were a good little team. Look at those little outfits we got on. I mean, this is back when you had to kind of pay for your own jersey, and we had to iron the numbers on and all that stuff, you know. Uh, this wasn't really highly organized. The other thing was, uh, this was Im imbued in me at a young age. So, uh, has anybody heard of Stu Leonard? Do you know who Stu Leonard is? He's the guy that started a famous grocery store in Chicago. I'm sorry, not Chicago, Connecticut. And uh, my father actually took me down there. This is, this is actually chiseled in stone out in front of the store. And the store, you know, it's an unbelievable store. It's kind of like Whole Foods before Whole Foods existed. It's experiential shopping. And the idea here is that the customer's always right. If the customer's ever wrong, reread rule one. I, I, it seems so obvious, right? But a lot of people don't get it, you know? And then the other part about that is how do you get the tribe to all believe that way and, and to, to, to be able to say, you know, instantaneously, like, okay, you know, Dan's not here, you know, with a blowtorch on my back, but he's, this is what we believe in. So we had this, you know, above everybody's desk. We had it in the way you coming in. We actually had these signs everywhere. We had, like, little things we print put in people's pockets. So I'm going to show you some things here that, that over time kind of, uh, that, that I, I learned as a child, you know, and then realized, well, these are, these are self-evident truths. But the, sometimes the self-evident truth, it's hard to apply. It's hard to get everybody on the same page. Has everybody seen that before, that thing? Yeah, well, it's a good one, you know, and it's not going to ever change. It's not going to ever change. I mean, obviously, sometimes, you know, you might have a difference with a customer, like they don't pay their bill or they're unsafe, but, you know, this is something here that I think you might like. Wait a minute. Let's see if I can get that to play. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Have we got a volume? Right here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. Okay. So this is just kind of a, a little slide show. Be sure to. I'm worried about Jimmy Gilbert. He's not my brother, too. What do you mean? Yesterday, I left him alone for a minute, and he disassembled the TV, our clock, mm -hmm. and the stereo. <laughs> That's perfectly normal. <laughs> it's fixed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, and this is the funny thing, when I was a kid growing up, my dad said, no, listen, the last thing you want to be in your life is an engineer, because you're a dime a dozen, you know, he had friends that worked for General Electric and all this stuff, and of course, what I, you know, screw you, I'm going to be an engineer, and then of course, when I became an engineer, he's real proud of it, but uh, it's funny, you know. So this is the beginning of the company. Uh, 1984, I, I decided I want to start my own business. And what, after I met Hugh Smith, he said, well, pick one of those things. I said, I'll start a gas company. To give you an idea how it is to start a company, I mean, I had to make that sign myself, you know, and bolt it on, buy a used truck. I did all the deliveries myself, and then I hired a part-time driver and a part-time bookkeeper. So that was the company in the beginning. And uh, I'll show you some numbers about how we did with that little business. But we started in with zero. Absolutely zero, zero customers, zero revenue, zero blah, blah, blah. And uh, our customers, our co competitors had cylinders that looked like that. And this is where Thomas came in because Thomas helped me finance uh, a fleet of these cylinders. But you know, I bought one of those or two of those to begin with. And our competitors had these carbon steel cylinders. You, you've seen these in labs, right? I mean, they're used so 
for its cryogenic liquid cylinders, a big vacuum bottle with, with liquid nitrogen at minus 300 degrees Fahrenheit. So that was my background, heat transfer thermodynamics. And so when I got busy with sales, and uh, pretty soon we were up to this, I think my first group of cylinders, I, I think I may be financed through the bank, I'm not sure. But in our business, a big part of the business was having the uh, uh, you know, product. By the way, you have to have something delivered on time. And I was in the business of, of, of a broad base of repeat order customers with a consumable product. That is a great place to be, you know, the old razor, razor blade. So everybody wants to do software as a service and they want to monetize. But if you can get a broad base of customers and you get a relationship with that customer, that is where the power and the flywheel in the business is. So I've got something here I want to show you. Uh, how did I get to that point? I mean, that's pretty far along. I got a warehouse there. I got some cylinders with my name on. I was the first guy in the country to put my name on the cylinder. I don't know why nobody thought of that. <laughs> but this little, I'm going to pass this little box around. This, this is actually, this was before the Internet. This is 1985. There was a time, believe it or not, where we didn't do, have the Internet. We had yellow pages. And this is, these are my customers in here. And this, I'll pass this around. The, each one of these little pieces here is a sales call. And I got the name of the company. This, you know, I had directories. You get, you get like manufacturing directories that come out of the library. And there would be the, uh, what was it, the Richard Morris thing. You could look up all the labs. You, yeah, Robert Morris. You could look up uh, by SIC. I don't know if they still call it SIC. There's something called the Standard Industrial Classification. So I would look up pulp mills, paper mills, you know, steel mills, rubber mills, all that kind of stuff food processors. And so here's one here. This is Immunogenics Corporation, care of Virginia Mason. And I wrote down here, here's the contact. And then I, those are the number of sales calls I made on that. And that'd be in person. Telephone call, quote such and such, spoke with Pat. This is over a oh, two-year period. And uh, they buy from Cryogenics Northwest. These, none of these turned into customers. These are all cold calls, every one of these, you know, in person. And you can see the number of them. Those are all, they didn't yield anything. So the idea is that you have to go out to get customers. They just don't come rolling in. I mean, maybe it's different in the Internet in this day and age. But for a business-to-business -business sale where it's a really complex thing like we're doing here, I'll pass that around for you. Just take a, get a sense for that. You know, that, there's a lot of time there. And so I, I just set a goal to make 10 sales calls a day. And I did it. Get on the phone. I, had, I was working in my basement. I had a little three-month-old baby. Had a sign on the basement door that said the world's greatest specialty gas company, and that was just me with a $39 telephone. There's no cell phones <laughs> even back then. So, uh, you know, focus. The flywheel. Has anybody read the book Good to Great? Do you know about that book by Collins? Is it, who, who can explain what the flywheel is? Anybody know what the flywheel? You, you read it? Yeah. So, uh, like a machine, a heavy weighted wheel, it's really hard to get started. Exactly. But once you get it up to speed, Exactly. And the key thing is, is there's two or three other pieces to that. Exactly. So you get this flywheel that you, know, you come in first day, you know, the second day, and pretty soon you get it barely moving. And then, you know, a few, whatever it is, a thousand efforts later, you're just going bing on the top of the thing and this, right? But here's the thing. you got to pick the flywheel, the right one, and you got to keep pushing the same flywheel, and you got to keep pushing it in the same direction. And that's where a lot of people break down. They get an idea, they get a logo, they get some sort of a, they might get a small, you know, angel grant or something like that. But it takes time. It takes time. And that is all about this flywheel thing. So this was what the company ended up looking like when I sold it. Uh, it was in business 25 years. Um, and we had 60 employees, two locations, Seattle and also um, Portland. I had three tanker trucks. These, these are what I borrowed the money from the bank on. These are these are a quarter million dollars a pop, actually. And then we had, you know, bulk tanks. We were filling her out. Once you start, and that's the other thing, backward integration, you know. One time I was just merely a middleman. Then I got to the point where my volume was big enough that I put a bulk tank in, and then I put another tank in, and I put a helium tank in over here. And so I was really a, yeah, we had helium. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, these, this took a lot of time, but it's, it's incremental also. You know, it isn't like step changes. But... Uh, <laughs> Thomas and Jim uh, Limey, who was Thomas's boss, were the ones that allowed me to build. I, I did an SBA loan. And we, that would be a whole separate subject, probably, just but borrowing money. But money is a tricky thing to get. I think you said money, right? Or somebody did. And, um, you know, I, I had some family and friends. You know, my father said to me, I, I was offered the chance to run our family business. And I said, Dad, I really want to know if I can make it on my own. 
He said, well, fine, we'll, we'll loan you some money if you need to. So I borrowed money at 12%, you know, from the family. I mean, they weren't that easy on me, okay? You know, but I borrowed 90 grand. And, you know, my brother gave me a little bit, and my father gave me a little bit, and I paid it back. But, you know, that, I was fortunate. That's lucky. It's not easy to get the seed money. And so I had people that believed in me, and it was family. But when you first start a business, I mean, there's, there's people like Elon Musk that can get, you know, money from venture capitalists and that kind of thing. But when you start your own business, it's probably going to be family and friends. And so, you know, try to nurture that network now. Get people to believe in you. Because if you do have your idea, you know, people will, will, will support you. And I'm going to talk about a little bit later, the last 10 years of my life, how I've believed in some people and it's been, I haven't been all that successful. Now, they're not family members, but they're, you know, friends, kind of inve investment network stuff. That's what it looked like. I mean, it's pretty impressive, you know. <laughs> Uh, even I'm looking at this and I say, holy smoke, look at all this stuff we got going. So we had these fill systems. These are all full gases ready to go. We had the best packaged gas standards in the industry. In other words, you know, you, we, I was giving speeches in the all over the country about this subject because you can differentiate every, sub every product you do. You, know, you, you augment the physical product with, with, with all kinds of things, cleanliness, you know, on-time delivery, answering the phone on the third ring. You know, doing what you say you're going to do for the customer. So this is a, a, a complicated business in that we're, we're making, making medical grade bas gases. We are uh, FDA compliant. We have, you know, these are red ones, are flammable gases. We even had a color code. Red kind of made sense for flames, you know. And then blue is, uh, you know, nitrous oxide or oxygen, et cetera. And so uh, this is what the business looked like. And I got to the point where, you know, some of the challenge that I had in the business was going out of it. And I'll talk a little bit about this evolution of self as you, as you, as you go forward. Okay, let's talk about money. I mean, what are those cylinders? How much is that? Yeah, yeah, good question. So these individual high-pressure cylinders, about a, these are, this is a great business, by the way. <laughs> but you've got to get customers to, to do these. These ones here are not generating any revenue. They're sitting in the warehouse, right? So you know about the three types of inventory, right? Do we know about LIFO and FIFO? Have we had accounting here yet? Yeah. Well, All right. There's three. There's fish, too. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Thomas. <laughs> this guy's the greatest. So, yeah, so there's LIFO's last and first out, FIFO's first and first out. Fish, is anyone what F-I-S-H is? First in, still here. here. <laughs> okay, and we, we, that's part of business. You know, you got to take a write-off, but you don't want to do too much of that if you can help it. So the cylinders are, are, are generate revenue, not these ones in here, but $125 for one of these and about $1,100 or $1,500 for one of these. And these generate these cylinders generate about five six bucks a month in rent. So, if you think about it, and the nice thing about it is you can do accelerated depreciation. They appreciate over time, so they're a revenue-producing type asset. You know, I, I want every asset that I have to produce revenue, produce income. You know, whether it's real estate. You know, I'm building a house right now. I'm going to show you the picture of it. I'm building an apartment in there. You know, M make sure that every every investment you make, because it's, it's easy to blow money on websites. You know, maybe that's going to develop some revenue. That would, if it de develops revenue, great. But when you get to the point where you have to, what the, the biggest problem you're going to have is the allocation of your, your your resources, your energy, your time, your money. And it's easy to make a mistake. It's really easy to make a mistake. And so you almost have to be, what um, uh, my professor in, bu in business said to us. He said, "Look, you know, you entrepreneurs do better." And this has happened to me. You know. You do better when you're kind of leveraged and when you're worried about your money because it's sort of like walking along the edge of the cliff. You know, you're, you're careful. When you, you know, when you sell your business, and I went through this, and all of a sudden you're flush with cash, you know, it flies out of your pocket pretty fast. And, you know, and I, I've been pretty good about not being crazy about it, but I've tried things that were, A, maybe not my passion, B, I didn't have a skill set for it, and, uh, you know, I've done some angel investment primarily. And, uh, but this one worked, you know. Um, oh, this is something else. So this is what our lab looked like. I put a half a million dollars into a lab. And when I tell you what, where, where this lab is now, it's, it's not, I can almost cry over it. But uh, this is one of my, this was like great employee, this guy Gary. We designed all this stuff ourselves. I mean, I designed all the piping. This is for filling. This is making what they call gravimetric blends. We can make uh, emission test gases, gases that are used for, like, for instance, for global warming that we have 300 ppm in air and they use those to calibrate the detectors or smokestacks uh, or medical gases, that kind of thing. You know, here's these, remember we set up these gas package standards and certification documents with seals. Here's a little simple thing you learn. See that little plastic heat shrink seal? We used to get customers to call them and say, hey, you deliver us an empty gas cylinder. I say, oh really? 
okay. Go give them a brand new one. You, know, you got to drop everything, send out 75 bucks worth of gas and a truck. It, you know, it ends up costing you know, a couple hundred bucks. And you know, you, well, it turns out that a lot of times the customer would have used the gas and just you know, put the empty back in the full pile. And so what we did was we put a heat shrink. I mean, this is a simple little thing, you know. Put a heat shrink seal on every gas package. And then if that seal was removed, well, then we know that the gas had been used. So all of a sudden, it, not, only, it, not only were we making more money, but it was improving. Do you want to sit on this side over here? Or is it, you, you okay there? Yeah. Uh, it was improving the, the well, the perceived uh, service as well as, um, as well as just managing the business better, you know. I mean, is that's a little, those cost two cents a piece, right? And, you, you know, you, it's all these things you learn. It's all these little incremental differences that make the... So I, I think about all the infinitesimal details. All these infinitesimal details add up to make an infinite difference. And it's, sometimes it's hard to know which one. It's not just one. It's all of them. It's the collection, right? It's the collection of the painting of the cylinder and putting the bump band on it so the label doesn't get mixed up and then having different types that are... And then the accurate paperwork so that the customer has a certificate document in a reliable fashion. Uh, then I got into the design, and this is what I've been spending the last period of my life on uh, here is designing what are called cryo repositories. So, you know, if you think about the future of medicine, it's this immunotherapy stuff, and it's bone. So this is these are this is a bone marrow storage facility. And this is a, a umbilical cord blood storage facility. So, uh, the future of medicine. We've heard a lot about stem cells, regeneration medicine, and a lot of this being done in Seattle. So. You talk about luck, you know, I mean, I got in the gas business in 1984. There was one biotech firm, was Immunex, it, which then became Amgen, and then it was moved out of Seattle. There was only one biotech firm, and I, I didn't see the biotech thing coming. I mean, I, I always thought about semiconductors and government research and nuclear energy and that kind of thing. The biotech business blossomed when I, when I, I got started. And I ended up having, at the end of 25 years, there were 25 biotech firms in Seattle, and I had 24 of them as customers. 24 out of 25. And the 25th we didn't we didn't really want. They were they were a customer that all they bought, they were bought by Merck and they were buying on price only. So you know business, what are the four P's in business? Do we have that? Do we do we talk about those? It's people, product, um, people's not the one I'm looking for. Products one. Product, yeah, I have one. Right. Anybody else remember the four P's? You gotta everything's gotta have you gotta have the four P's, otherwise you're not in business. Product, price, place, promotion. And so um, when you get into this idea of, I don't know, I lost my train of thought there. We were talking about the, bio, oh, the biotech business. Yeah, so you, know, you don't want pricing to be the only factor. You know? I mean, I, I don't want to, anybody that says, hey, uh, you know, spending 200 bucks a month and blah, 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 I say, okay, but what's your time worth? You know, it's, harder to sell, it's harder to sell something, you know, and that's better, with a customer where you're showing them the value of what you're selling, not the price. So, and it gets into this, if you don't have all three, if you don't have a good product, and the product is, you know, is, is obviously customer service and it's delivery and it's all those things, your pricing's got to be reasonable. The place, you got to choose your place. Now, that's about your channel. So I decided to focus just in the Northwest. And, you know, it's, the Northwest is nice if you're in a service business because we're kind of out here with a moat around us, you know, this little uh, island, you know. The, you, the, the Mountain California, people don't want to come up here and compete or it's hard to get here and three time zones and all that. And, for the, in, in the business where we were in, which is lab, laboratory supply and high-tech manufacturing, 50% of the business is between Boston and D.C. We're about 8% or 6% of the, of the national business in that area. So we're a small market, which small market's good. A lot of people, like a friend of mine has a gas business in Hawaii. He's the only guy. You know, nobody else wants to do it. I mean, you know, who wants to take him on? And he's, he's got pricing power. So, you know, this idea of pricing power and, and then how do you get pricing power? Well, it's, it's a lot of things, but choosing the place is important, okay? Then, uh, then we had our warehouse and fill plant. I think I showed you that. These are some of the freezers that went in. And this is our medical gas filling system. You know, you got a woman, a little, she's got a chemistry degree, and, and uh, you know, we were able to provide medical gases, which are it's an FDA-regulated uh, material. Did a lot of engineer gas systems, so this is the stuff that I did, designed, installed. Here's, here's where I really got, I should, maybe not smart, smart, but what I decided to do was customers needed systems like this. I'd say, okay, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll provide the system to you, lease the whole system and provide all the gases in a turnkey package. And I, then, then, then I learned at, at business school, I went to a three-year program at Harvard Business School, uh, three weeks a year over, over, so nine weeks total. 
And uh, what, what our professors there were talking about, about the numbers and profitability, but also, you know, if, to the extent you can get your customers, let's say, tied up with some paper by having a, an agreement, you know, we call it an agreement, so that would be a service agreement, that created a tremendous enterprise value in my company. At the, at the time when we sold it, 80% of the gas business that we had, which is about 85% of our business, was under, under agreement. So you know that the, whoever buys it subsequently says, okay, you know, I'm buying something solid here. At the end of the day, what you've got is a, a revenue stream that's profitable, that's of value to somebody else, okay? So building enterprise value is what it's all about at the end so of the day. Exactly. Yeah, those systems, like a lot of times the system, you lease the system. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the nice thing about, and, and then I would borrow this, I borrow money from, from the bank to, to pay for these systems, yeah. and then in turn lease those to the customer, and then have a service agreement which includes the gas. Yeah. So this is this package integration stuff, you know, to the extent you can, uh, you can tie different things together and provide a value proposition. So if we, do we talk about the, you guys use that, the model like, uh, you know, when you talk about a custom, you know, the basic idea of a business is you have, this is your target customer, right? And, you know, to the extent you can identify that customer, and, and that's all the things that we've talked about. It's, you know, it's geography, it's, it's, it's you know, growth, you know, it's, it's, it's alignment, right? To give you a case in point, um, it's, uh, you know, it's going to be the industry they're in, okay? Are these safe, right? Um, it turns out that, like we, for in, Intel was, was, was one of my prime customers. They have a big operation down in Oregon and also one in, in DuPont area. I, could, I was really good at a couple of little products there, but when it came to like their toxic gases and the gases that are used to make the sil silicon uh, wafers, there's some really nasty gases, silane, arsine, phosphine, stuff like that. Uh, Intel says, look, we're a global company. We need a global supplier. So my supplier, Air Products, would take care of them. They have, you know, they have a Learjet with a response team that could fly anywhere in the world. I didn't have that. But I had other, other people. I could get a little niche as a business there. Same with Boeing. Uh, Starbucks was my biggest customer at one time, and I lost them. And uh, my <laughs> how can you lose it when your kid's the roommate with Howard Schultz, Schultz's kid? I did, you know. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, and it turned out that uh, they were using a lot of uh, nitrogen for, for packaging coffee. All the, you know, the coffee bags had that little check valve in there. They're all filled, back filled with nitrogen. And uh, they ended up building a plant in York, PA, and then we're going to build another plant, I think, in Singapore or someplace like that. And they said, look, you know, we need a supplier that can take care of us globally. I said, well, I'm not, I can't do that. And so, you know, it was a good relationship. Well, it grew, well, it grew and we helped at the beginning. But at some point, there's not an alignment with customers, you know. And so then you think about, okay, I've got this customer, target customer, you know, wh what is the need set, right? Okay. So, for instance, uh, I had a customer that, um, a, a competitor, a friend of mine, said, well, what business are you in? We said, we'll, we'll get any, anybody anything they want. I said, ooh, boy, this, you know, <laughs> it's a pretty, pretty tall order. He said, yeah, if they need toilet paper, we'll deliver that to them, you know. I said, you know, we're not in the copy machine business, you know. We're not in, you know, we're not in the... Uh, well, we don't, for instance, we said to certain customers, and this is this bar, barbed wire thing, so if, um, if you envision barbed wire here around this, um, and this is another concept of define your strategy by saying no. And the whole idea here is you say no to certain customers. You know, the most important decision you can make is once you choose this target customer, is who you say no to. So I didn't do muffler shops. I didn't do government contracts. Every time I did a government contract, it was a pain in the you know, I get audited or whatever, you know. And so, so we said no to somebody that, first of all, they don't pay their bill, you know, they're, they're too small, whatever it is. You know, somebody's got to be careful about because a small guy can turn into a big guy or gal. And then you've got, uh, you know, these other things where, that were, you know, we, for instance, we had, uh, we got in the beverage gas business, which we call leisure gas, but, uh, you know, like there's micro brews, they have nitro beer and all that kind of stuff. So we, made, we had this, I had a call a beer grade gas. I had a brown cylinder with like a creamy, color shoulder on it looked like a Guinness. <laughs> I was trying something, you know. The poor guy down in the paint shop was going, geez, every time you turn around, I come up with a new color. And so, um, but we, you know, we're sending our trucks, which are used to going to hospitals and used to go into like uh, reproductive clinics and uh, biotech labs and high-tech environmental and sophisticated manufacturing. We're sending them into a bowling alley, you know, or we're sending them into, we get a call at two o'clock in the morning from 
was that place down downtown that said GameWorks or something like that. And you know, you 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 take you you get you you have you only have so many people that are going to be on call that can take the phone and, at two o'clock in the morning and make a delivery. You don't. We we just said no to bars. You know, I I just didn't even though they were buying a reasonable amount of gas. You say, look, you know, it just isn't good for us. You know, I don't want our drivers going into bars. You know, and this everything else. So. You got to find your strategy by saying no, and that frees you up to, to focus on this other stuff, okay? And so you got the need set, and then so you got to define what need set you're in, right? I mean, in our place, it was the gas and equipment, et cetera. And what we're not doing safety supplies. I was not doing welding equipment. And somebody, I remember when I started my business, people said, look, there's no way you can start a gas business and not serve the welding industry. You know, this is guy, people are doing structural steel, uh, you know, pipelines, all that. And they said, well, you know, I don't really like welding that much. I mean, I, I don't have a passion for it. You know, I mean, I'm more of a, therm I'm a thermodynamicist, and, 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 and so I want to use gases that way. So in, in a way, what it freed us up to do was I wasn't competing on construction jobs. I wasn't competing on government bids. They said, well, you know, every time we get a government bid, it goes right in the round file. Every time we get a job for some construction thing, right in the round file. Every time you get something that says, uh, you know, we need to have supply of, of, of like welding uh, like gloves and gla goggles. It's a big business, so they call it PPE business, personal protective equipment, you know, hard hats and all that. We just don't do it. You know, we do gas. And so if you can f focus your, on, on, on the need set, and then what you gotta do is you, you come up with, in, you know, it's a fancy word, value proposition, right? So if you, is people, you, have you used that term here in business? Okay. And so what you do is you take your you take all your resources and energy, you, t you pick this very carefully, you pick this very carefully, and this is, again is aligned what, with your passion and your knowledge, and then this thing kind of comes out naturally over time. And you, you try things, you know? And uh, at one time I thought my business was gonna be big on these like wine and nerding systems for the home. You know, like the soda stream thing? I was trying to develop one of those things, and I was looking at like, you know, government labs and government labs is all bid work, and all of a sudden you, know, you start. I mean, you turn around. And all, you know, I'm, I'm taking care of somebody that's making, uh, you know, little rocket motors for uh, for satellites in outer space. So somebody's here from the space business. You know, rocket research over there, big customer of ours. Yeah, I mean, they're making those little those little thrusters that go on the rockets and all that. You know, and uh, all that Bezos and all that stuff and wasn't around when it, when I was in the gas business. But uh, so that's that's kind of the basic thing when you're thinking about your business. Who's my customer? You know, who's not going to be my customer? What are the needs that we're going to go after? What are we not going to go after? Right? You know, this the idea of a strategy defined by saying no, I always use the example of the Ten Commandments. And I, I can't recite all ten of them, but eight of the Ten Commandments are thou shalt not. You know, you don't you know, steal, you don't kill somebody, you don't all that, take whatever it is. I mean, there's only a couple of affirmative ones, things like, you know, love your neighbors, you love yourself, and love God, or something like that, right? You can do whatever you want to do. Just don't do these eight things, okay? Just don't do these eight things. And so, so with us, you say, like, you know, we don't sell below a certain margin with your, so this idea of levers of control in a business, you've got to set up these expectations and systems in place and get everybody to say, okay, you know, we only sell at, you know, 40% gross margin or above. We, only, we don't sell to customers that are unsafe. We're only going to sell to customers that can pay their bills on time. Customers who, with whom we can do projects together, maybe somebody we can learn from. So this, again, choosing that customer is really important. And, and then, because you know, what is a business? Remember we talked about it. A business is about a customer. If you don't have a customer, you don't have a business. You got to constantly go back to that core. It's right here. Who is our customer? What's their problem? So, and then the other thing is you come up with a series of questions for your customers. I mean, I got, Actually, it took 25 years to be fairly good at some things. One of which is what questions to ask a customer. You know, you go in there and ask him these open-ended questions like, you know, what's your biggest problem with your gases and what does an ideal solution look like? And then shut up. You know, what is your problem? You know, and then, so there's that type of thing. The other thing that I learned over time was if you could get walking around somebody's facility and start, you can see things that they don't see. So you ever had a situation where you know, you know, you have a problem. You know, you might go to take your car in and you, you know, you got a flat tire or whatever. And the customer, the uh, uh, mechanic might spot something like, you know, your, by the way, your, your oil's dirty or whatever it is. It's the problem the, the customer doesn't even know about. You help him or her see. That's where you get some value. So, you know, let's say they have something that's unsafe. Or you go in there and you learn that, like, hey, by the way, you know, you have, uh, we had a customer uh, that had a, uh, 
a, a, it was called a fermenter, about the size of two basketballs, and had a quarter million dollars worth of, uh, of product in it. They were making a, dr a pharmaceutical drug, biopharmaceutical. And uh, they had a gas system that didn't have an alarm on it. And sure enough, you know, we spotted it before they had a problem. Said, so, hey, let's put an alarm with a backup system in here. You know, I think I showed you some of those gas systems. You know, primary gas, secondary gas, with a tertiary gas, with an alarm that'll ring off and, you know, send somebody a pager, right? I mean, because th that company had lost, uh, they lost uh, gas had run out in a couple of processes in a different city, lost a quarter million dollars, one basketball's worth of this stuff. You know, they're selling picograms of stuff for hundreds of dollars a gram. So understanding the customer's need set and then helping them understand, helping them spot problems before they become a problem. Tremendous value, and this is where the relationship comes in, okay? And um, this is Bobby. This guy, he ended up being our production manager, but he figured out how to make those things look like that. <laughs> this guy, he's an uh, ex-military guy. We hired him right out of the military, he's great. And we, somebody said, we can't make the cylinders look new like new. And this guy had been like a body worker or something before, and he said, no, no, he figured out, he, he got this machine, rolling them on his side, he made this thing, and he's, he, he started buffing these cylinders up, and our cylinders started looking like a million bucks, you know? So we call it the, the, the Bobby standard for, for refurbishing. Because people said, oh, you can't make them look clean again. They, once they're old, they look old. Well, not really. If you get, get, get a creative person out there that has a different background. This guy, you know, he, he knew how to make, do body work since he was a kid. And then we learned about, you know, these things. Like, here's, this is a simple thing, but this is a tag out. This is, you know, repair service tag. You know, a lot of times equipment gets in, it comes in there and it's got a problem, it's got a broken valve, it's, the labels aren't right. I don't know what that one says. It says, uh, uh, I don't know, oh yeah, it, it, that means the relief valve was wrong. But you know, you can do things like put your name on it, you can have repair tags, you can have, uh, I came up with the idea for this for like, I don't know, somebody fixed something in our facility and left a tag, you know. I, I, I repaired this thing on a certain date and putting a number on it or whatever. And then, you know, packaging, and this for children's was one of our good customers. But those are ideas I got from other people. So the other thing is, where do you get your ideas? Well, there is, I, I know we got some bright people here, you know. But there are very few original ideas. You know, at the end of the game, what you do is you go out and copy, copy the best. You know, I learned from Starbucks about branding. I learned about Robert's oxygen from putting plastic bags on a cylinder. I learned, uh, you know, the polishing thing from this guy that came in. You know, you don't you don't have all the answers, but somebody does. And and most of the things you're doing are incremental. You know, we're not. You know, we all talk about Uber and all this stuff, but when we talk about a service business, it's all about differentiation and all these little different pieces of it add up together. You know, here's education. You know, this is an idea I came up with. Everybody says, like, what's a ball valve? What's a solenoid valve? What's a, you know, what is a extended stem cryogenic valve? So we just took a panel and I laid it out in this piece of plastic and, and then, you know, both of these things on there and we put it in the lunchroom. So our lunchroom was a learning location. Everything's learning. You know, we had our part numbers up there. We had, uh, you know, a little museum, right? You want everybody just, even when they're just having lunch, to be looking at this, oh, that's what a ball valve is, you know? And that way you can, you get, you know, we talk about this tribal knowledge thing, right? You know, the tribes all got to know the word ball valve, what it means, right? They got to know what a solenoid valve is. And, you know, this is a pretty kind of an esoteric thing, some of these. And, and to know the difference between those, that's what allows your, your tribe to become the most knowledgeable group, right? It's all about constant education. So here's some of our guys, and this is the part that I missed. <laughs> it almost looks like you're asleep, but yeah, Adam. But these, these are the guys we had. And I think, you know, you get a tribe, and a, so even little things like uniforms, you know, in our business, you know. Um, and, you know, I let the guys pick their, they wanted to go black, so we started going with these black uniforms. And pretty soon they were wearing these shorts. They wanted to look like the Federal Express guys, you know. And, and uh, you know, we, so we have a lot of, you can have fun at all this stuff, too, you know. And, and um, this is, we won the Mayor's Small Business of the Year Award. That was Norm Rice right there. Uh, and this is our team. This guy here was my mentor. So this is another thing, you know, uh, I think, you know, we none of it. So Jim Liming, Tom's boss, Thomas's boss, was one of my mentors. And so uh, this guy ran an industrial distribution business in, in the specialty steel, and I, and I met him, and uh, he didn't have any sons. And, um, you know, I just, I paid him so much a month to come with us and meet with us. But he, he met with me every month for about 10 years. And uh, the first thing he said to me was, you know what you got to do here? You got to make a profit. And so I'll show you some stuff here. Every, I'm going to pass this book around. He, he made me write down reports every month. This is just a book that's got, I call it marketing. So I've got all my, my whole, my whole uh, 
career kind of archive, but you know, there's a history of the logo and all that. But here's the original, I've got it right here. This one page, I'll, I'll put it to that page. This is the, my original business plan at, at, at eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. Well, I didn't have a computer back then. There were no computers. But, and then he, he made me put together, and I'll show you the original, here's our original financial. There's my business plan, which was like three pages long. And then here's some of our original financial statements. And you know, I typed those all by hand. I'll just pass this around and show it to you. But he made me come up with a report every month. And we looked at key things, cash, you know, debt, you know, new orders, new customers. And so we started, you know, the whole idea if you can't measure it, right? So do we know about SMART goals here? Has anybody heard that before? Thomas, do we know about that? Where is he? So we, we ran our business on SMART goals and everybody had goals. So what, what, what it's an acronym for specific, right? And I'll give, you, I'll give an example of a SMART goal and a non so SMART goal. Measurable, specific, measurable, attainable, right? Relevant and time bound. So one goal might be, hey, we want to improve customer service. You know, okay, you know, that's certainly relevant. It's certainly attainable to, and, and, but it's not time bound. It's not specific. So we said like, no, we want 99.9% we want .9 of our orders to be on time. And we're gonna measure that. And, and by, you know, you know, by 1231, you know, you know, 97, whatever the number is. You measure it, you know, you have a sales, Team, you know, say, okay, I'm going to make 10 sales calls a day. Okay, that's specific. It's measurable. It's certainly attainable. If you set 100 sales calls a day, it wouldn't be attainable, right? It's relevant and it's time bound. And so, if you can run your business, and uh, with the, I, we ran it with just a spreadsheet, basically. You know, we had a strategic plan, but you got, you know, what, who, when, and and you just keep track of these things. You know, you got what is it we're going to do? We're going to make you know 100 sales calls this month. We're going to get 10 new customers this month. And, and you just constantly measure against those things. Oh, that was my license plate. <laughs> Funny story about that. You know, there's a, used to be a guy on, on, the, on the television that, or the radio was a, a, a reporter that, that was, was he called Gas Man or something like that? He was, uh, he, he was a sports guy, right? Remember that, Gas Man? He was uh, up in Grouse Seattle. Gas. What? Graz with Gas. Graz with Gas. It was Graz with Gas. It was, it was, and, and so, I was playing golf one day, you know, up at like Jackson or something, like a Tuesday afternoon, you know. And some customer calls into the garage and says, "Hey, Graz, I saw your car up at uh, at Jackson yesterday at two o'clock. What were you doing?" You know, he's, and he said, uh, "That wasn't my car." And so some other guy calls in on the radio. Says, "Well, that was Dan Burns' call. He must be up playing golf right now." <laughs> so I had to, you know, you, you don't want some things you don't necessarily need to show off. You know, this is me and Brent, my my partner. Uh, so I met this guy. Um, in, I don't know what year it was. I was probably business seven or eight years. I needed more of a general manager and brought him on and he ended up, uh, ended up giving him 20% of the business and uh, he did well. He's, he was with Airgas a number of years. Brent Fernio, great guy. But you know, again, you know, you can't do that from day one because they couldn't afford him. But uh, we got to get real involved with this kind of thing for a while. Uh, you know, electrical telemetry, which is kind of fun. This is some of our guys in our facility. You know, here's the thing. You can make your facility look really nice relatively inexpensively. I mean, I just painted that wall green and put, you know, nice stickers on it. I mean, you don't need to go out and hire, you know, $200,000 $2, signed consultants. You know, do it yourself, for Lord's sake. You see how my own logo was in there. This is me and Brent. I was the first guy to put that. That's the running gas guy. So it's a, it's a cylinder that's running, you know, like this. So I had a woman help me design my logo, and I said, look, I want to have our gas cylinder look like Superman, you know, with a big chest with like a B on it, like, like the Super S, right? So she came back to me with this drawing. She had this, this the super gas cylinder, kind of had shoulders and arms, and, and the bottom was cut off and, and broken, and there was gas shooting out. It was flying, hurtling through space like a rocket. She goes, isn't that dynamic and high energy? I said, well, Susan, there's just one problem. I mean, the idea of a cylinder with a bottom broken off of it, you know, hurtling through outer space is just not a good idea. We're not, we're not, we're not in the hurtling, hurtling cylinder. Buy your cylinders from the hurtling gas cylinder company. I said, how about the running? So we put the legs on the guy, and we put it on the tank. It was fun. You can see it from I-5. So here's something that happened to me, uh, you know, and, and it's where I am. I still am, you know, in this thing. I didn't, I didn't make this up, and it's, it's a little hard to read, but... Somebody, uh, there's a book, and I, I, I meant to look the, the, the um, it's, it's like, it's something called, it's not what you know, or something like that, it's who you know, it's one of these little, little books that, you know, gives you advice about how to, like, there's seven habits of highly effective people, and there's the one minute manager, there's this other book that, 
talk, talks about you, you know, basically how your career evolves in life. And so if you think about this is a time scale from, from zero, you know, date of birth, to I'm, I'm using the number 90, you know, that's a pretty good number. And what happens is, you know, in the first beginning, you know, you're just a little baby, little teeny baby, have no idea what's going on. And like one to five, you kind of live in this little fantasy world. You know, you kind of run around, make believe. And then five to 10, you get this, what they call kernel of independence. So that means, you know, your mother lets you go out and take the bike down this corner and you can join the team on your own. You go off to school, right? You know, you forget your lunch and all that stuff. You get beat up by the big guy, all that, right? And then, you know, 15 to 20 is when you start getting into this tribe thing that we've talked about, you know? You join a club, you got your little group, you know, your socialization. It's all about being part of something bigger than yourself when you start to get to be up in this 15 age. That's why now 15 year olds are, <laughs> you know. And, uh, and then you get to be 20, and, and I'm just gonna say to 20 to 30, and a lot of, a lot of you here in this room right now, is that you go through like a, a career identification phase, right? You try a few things. In the old days it was, you know, you're 22, you get out of school, you go to GE, you get the gold watch at 35 years later. It's not that way anymore. And, but, you know, I took s several different jobs and everybody does this, but like, you know, are you gonna be a designer or are you gonna be a salesperson? Are you gonna be, you know, what is your career identification? What are you good at? What do you feel like your, your highest and best self is? And it takes a while. It doesn't happen instantaneously. And it takes reflection, and it takes you know, it takes um, it takes patience too, and focus. And then what happens when 30 to 40? What happens? And I started my business when I was 32, and you know that was good because I had 10 years of experience under somebody else's. So what do they say? Like a great doctor? Like, how'd you become a great doctor? Well, you know, I got a lot of experience. How'd you get a lot of experience? Well, I, I made a lot of mistakes, right? And so I made those mistakes on other people's nickel, right? And, uh, but 30 to 40, you get help, sort of hell bent on success, right? You know, you got to make your mark and you got a lot of energy then. You got some background, you've got some knowledge, you've got some technical skills, right? You know, people have invested in training you and that kind of thing. But you know, you got to start making your mark. When you get 40 and you're still figuring out what your career is, it's probably, you know, it's probably not good. <laughs> I mean, it's probably better to have a better sense of where you're going. You know, you, you, every once in a while you meet a 15-year-old and says, yeah, I'm going to be an ophthalmologist, uh, you know, and, and go to Harvard uh, you know, Medical School. You, you meet once, sometimes you meet kids like that, but, I mean, when I was a kid, I wanted to be an astronaut, but, uh, you know. <laughs> Sorry? I did, yeah, yeah. So if I came here, well, yeah, when I blew off the hydrogen in the basement, exactly. <laughs> and, um, and then what happens is, at 40, and this started happening to me, was, um, it happened in 50, I, I kind of had this watershed. So you hear about people, I mean, I, I don't know if other people have been through this, but this is, I'm gonna show you this story because this is where I am today and what I, you can't foresee this. I, I couldn't foresee it. You can read about it, you know? You know, you know, people go through the midlife crisis, you know, you only get a Ferrari and, you know, chase the secretary or whatever it is, you know, we have these kind of standard kind of thing or you fly off to Acapulco with, you know, all the company's money, whatever it is. In my case, what, happen, what happens is that when you get to be, after like 10 years of doing something really, really focused like I was doing, you start getting to repeating your successes. In other words, it's not a new experience. Like for me to make the first logo and put it in the truck was the first time I did it. And some of all the stuff on that notebook, the first time I did it. You know, after I'd made my fourth brochure, you know, we took BSG and we had 24 out of 25 biotech firms in Seattle. We went to Portland and within a year we're doing a million dollars down there. And so what it felt to me like was replication, you know. I knew it would work, you know, it's just a matter of, okay, we're going to go in, there was no, there, was, there wasn't any fear anymore, you know. I mean, it was some fear, but the challenge wasn't there, right. It was sort of, I had this burning need to kind of like, you know, sort of reinvent myself, you know. And so I'm right in this phase right here of giving back if I can, and I've tried, I've tried, and I've been successful to some extent, but like, what does giving back mean? Well, it means, uh, you know, uh, taking the things that we've, we've learned over our lives and try to help other people succeed, just like what Thomas is doing here. And so I'm excited about the chance to talk to you about it. And I could use some feedback on that. Where's the best way to give back? So I've, I've spent the last 10 years of my life, I sold my business 10 years ago, and I signed a 10-year non-compete, which, by the way, that's a, that's a long time. Don't do that if you, if you get a chance to do it. But Because um, it kind of, you know, kind of paint, well, you, you get into this no thing, and, and the other person's telling you what no is. You know, you're not telling it. So I, I had to stay away from my tribe for 10 years. The tribe, I was so close, and the tribe was big. It wasn't just my own employees. I couldn't, you know, they actually, they put, put they actually, uh, been a, I, I was gonna work for Air Gas, and I worked for them for two years, and, and, and about a month after I was there, they put me on the road, you know, go out and like tell the story, and I realized why, because 
I came back and there was this big heavy set guy sitting in my chair, you know. <laughs> I said, I said, you know, he doesn't know his name. I said, Frank, what, what's going on here? He goes, well, you know, we find that former owners work best from their home. Okay. Okay. And I had this chair. It was one of the, you know, when I hit a million dollars in sales, I gave myself a goal, you know, like a smart goal. A million dollars, buy the, 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 the little ergonomic Italian chair. I wanted to buy this Italian leather chair. It was like a thousand bucks. And I, I, I had this goal, you know, the, I had a picture of it there, a million bucks. I bought the chair and it was perfect. You know, it sit in my buns perfectly and everything. This guy just completely squashed it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so at any rate, then I had to say I had to say goodbye to the chair. You know? So at any rate, uh, I didn't. W <laughs> Now, my business, I'll show you where, where it ended up after this thing. So Air Gas bought the company, and um, anyway, this is, this is kind of a conflicted message, isn't it? <laughs> so this is the first year. So this is the industrial welding division, and then this is our division. And you, know, you can see what we did, you know, on-staff engineers, turnkey engineering, 24 by 7, you know? So we got all the 24 by 7 calls. We had five engineers at our company, and Air Gas had one. And they're a big company, but they just weren't in our same space. And the original idea was our DNA was going to be infused through this two billion or four billion dollar company, their Fortune 200. It, it doesn't happen, you know. It's like one one drop of DNA in the Pacific Ocean, basically. And uh, over time, uh, you know, I my uh, they I just couldn't get our value system and our systems and the way we did things, you know, the burn way and all that. We just couldn't push it through their system. They didn't buy it. The local guys didn't buy into it. You know, some guys say, we need to paint all the cylinders. We're up in Minneapolis. There's a lot of high-tech firms out there. You know, they make stents there. There's 3M there. There's a lot of computer companies. A lot of, a lot of like Seattle. And the guy goes, oh, yeah, why don't we paint the cylinders? We already have all the customers. This is too much work, you know? And it's okay, all right? You know, they just, so at the end of the day, I, you, you, I was really a, uh, you know, one man on a bicycle, you know, with a, with a mission that no one was listening to in, in the company. So, and that, that was probably something I, I, I probably could have foreseen, but I didn't. You know, this is that part of that knowledge, it's mystery. How much regret is in that? Well, there's, I, I, did well, I did well financially, so you have to look at, you know, I mean, I, it was, I was at a time when I sold it, uh, there was a big feeding frenzy going on, I had five cash offers, you know, and there was a bidding war. So there was a lot of consolidation in our industry going. So look, you gotta sell when the selling's good. So I sold in 2006. You know, if I'd gone through 2009, who knows where I would have been right now. So I don't regret my timing on it. I, I, I miss the tribe, though. Yeah. I miss the tribe, for sure. And, and I miss the sense of, you know, shared success, the sense of oneness of purpose. I miss all that. And I'm still working on that, and I'll show you some of the things I've tried. It's one of the reasons I'm down here, I think, you know. Um, I, I started writing a little book called Scratch Start, and it's called The David versus Goliath's Business Story of Dan Burns. Astonishing, look at the way I write about myself. Astonishing success, <laughs> astonishing success in an industry dominated by multi billion dollar multinational firms. A book about passion and beliefs applied. So when I heard the word passion right away, I realized that, you know, it is about passion, it's about beliefs, but it's about being applied. So, <coughs> you know, having, <coughs> excuse me, having, having a, a mechanism to, to continue to do that is what, I, what I, I do regret that, missing that a lot. Okay. But on the other hand, you know, I, I, I miss. Uh, having you know three little boys under the age of six walking around my house too, but I'm kind of glad they're not, <laughs> they're not walking around anymore. They they all have their own health care plans, you know, and they're, and they're launched, you know. So yeah, I I think that there's um, you know, and, and that's maybe the probably going to be the the central message here is that it isn't like you get into one place and you're there in your life, you know. It changes. Like my be my best friend is dying of cancer right now, and uh, I'm trying to spend a lot of time with him, but you know. Just because of the DNA flip of the switch, he's going and I'm not going, you know? And so time, you know, is important. Plus, you know, I look at all the young guys out there, and, and uh, I know, I'm looking around, I know there's, there's a range of ages here, but, you know, it goes pretty fast, I'll tell you what, you know? Before you know it, kids are gone. Before you know it, you're 50. Before you know it, you're 60, you know? I'm 65 now. Just turned 60. In fact, I got, I got Social Security. I got Medicare, excuse me. But, uh, you know, I still want to keep going. I want to keep, I want to keep engaged. And, and so I'm delighted to have this when Thomas called me. I first got me you know, a little nervous saying, oh, man, i got to give a speech. But I was, so far, no, no tomatoes, you know. Um, and then, then I was doing something like this. I mean, that's, that's a Venn diagram. It's a pretty scary-looking one. But, uh, you know, I was thinking about this idea of, like, 
what is that little, you know, intersection? So Venn diagram, you know, this is circles and stuff. And so, um, <clears throat> was there somebody named Venn? I don't know. There must have been, or was this, were the name diagram? But uh, you know, so I wanted to do something for which this is a career, uh, you know, a career set I call it, you know, but like market, passion, knowledge, team, innovation, uh, resources. By that meaning, I, I want to be able to put my resources in and have skin in the game, and uh, and also, you know, I want to do good. You know, I mean, I think you can. I, I like the three-legged stool. You can do do something for which you have a passion. Uh, it can be something that is of value to society, and you can get rewarded for it. You know, you need at least those three. I don't because otherwise it's not sustainable. You know, if it's if you're just getting paid, it isn't going to do it. If you're just doing good, but there's not, you know, resources that exceed your expenditures, that's not going to work. So the sustainability thing, when you talk about that with sustainability before, they, it means what it means today, but it meant you know, a sustainable business model, you've got to have, you know, some of these things. And I, you know, and I have my, you know, the energy future. I, I mean, I've, I've been involved with a few startups that have been involved with energy. And I'll, I'll talk about that because I've always been, I, uh, I went to college during the Arab oil embargo. Anybody remember the Arab oil embargo? I know some, couple, yeah, so 19, you guys are, and gals are too young, 1973 uh, or four, uh, you had to wait four hours in line every other day to get gas. And gas was going right through. And then when I when I first sold BSG in 2006, uh, <coughs> uh, oil was going up to like 140 a barrel. Remember that? We were paying five bucks a gallon. It wasn't that long ago. We're not thinking about it now so much. But I mean, this, the future of energy was something I, I felt strongly about, and I wanted to make a contribution in that. And I've I've actually actually have one success in it. I mean, it's amazing. It's not easy. And then I had, you know, characteristics of the explorer, and these are notes I took. You know, somebody just, just take a piece of paper and write down, like, what I want to be. I want to be an explorer, and I wrote down, you know, curiosity, observation, and, and being open and not biased, independent, you know, a sense of purpose and meaning, okay? And that's the thing that I'm, 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 I've learned. If you don't have a sense of sh purpose and meaning that you share with other people, it's not nearly as, 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 as rich as it could be. Okay, what's the purpose and meaning of it, right? So I got involved with Habitat for Humanity, and I fell in love with this little guy. He was, he was like seven years old. His name is Isaias, like Isaiah. I built a couple of houses in, in, in Paraguay. Uh, does it, you know, but the, uh, Habitat has this thing called Global Village, where you can go to a different country. We actually built houses from scratch by hand. You know, I think I dug that ditch down there, and uh, or actually that's going to be a septic tank kind of thing. And uh, so I spent six months there. It was, it was weird. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, you know about Paraguay. They just had, like, I think, I think they just had a, another coup. But it's, uh, it's a landlocked country. It was run by a German dictator for 35 years. The Germans went over after World War II and just took this place over. And they had those big hats and everything. And uh, so it was, it was a really interesting experience for me. But, uh, you know, I, I actually then became, and I was, came back and I was going to be, uh, I, ran for the executive, I ran for the position of executive director for Habitat for Humanity in King County. And I made the finalist, and uh, five of us out of like 150 people. And I realized that it just wasn't the right place for me. I mean, I sat in the interview, and, they, and, and I said, well, what are, what are our goals? And like, I got 10 different goals, you know. I, I said, well, well, you know, I can't, if you can't tell me what the priorities are here, I'm going to have a problem. And it wasn't necessarily about, um, you know, it was about brotherhood. There's a lot of, you know, there's a lot of different, it's a complex, a lot of uh, nonprofits have a very complex kind of thing they're trying to do. You know, it's about the brotherhood of the people that work there. It's about you know, what the fundraisers do. It's about what the Habitat National wants to do. It's about the Seattle housing. It's a very complicated job. And I wasn't the right guy. So I'm, I've just done volunteer work for them. Uh, <laughs> that's me. Uh, I, I did a, a transcontinental uh, race across Africa. And that was, that was pretty wild there. Uh, we, we went from, uh, we were the first Americans to do it from Budapest, Hungary to a place called Guinea-Bissau, which is now in you know, West Africa. It was wild. We went across like you know Mauritania. We went across these places like where there was there was nobody. You know, it was like no man's land. It was unbelievable. I can't believe we did it. My son went with us, and thank thank the Lord he was with us because we would have been. We bought we bought a truck with a drive on the wrong side. I I, I, I didn't know that the roads were the other way down there. <laughs> and so you're driving down these incredible roads. What, what an experience that was. Uh, that's us going across the uh, Tropic of Cancer. That was our truck load up. We had this guy here was uh, actually a, a he still is a writer for GQ magazine. And he was embedded in, in the truck with us, Sean Flynn. I met him. I went down to, remember where the miners were buried down in, in Chile? The, 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 the uh, Trente Tres um, Mineros, they were buried down there. Remember when they discovered those guys with that drill bit? I went down there just to be there when that was going on and uh, I met the guy. This guy, so it was kind of interesting. 
This is us crossing over someplace. Uh, I climbed Aconcagua, which uh, is a big one. You know, that's the biggest mountain in Western Hemisphere. It was hard, but fun. These are my non-successes, and I think, you know, this, each one of these is a story, but uh, there might be one or two more in there. And, um, you know, these are places, when I say non-successes, what does that mean? Well, I, I put money and time into something, and it's no longer, it didn't, it didn't stick. There was, the flywheel doesn't rolling anymore, you know? I was pushing on the wrong flywheel. We talked about the flywheel push, and, and uh, energy retrofit, I put a lot of time and energy into that, and that was when, 2007, eight, a full-time, you know, uh, hired two staff. I had the audit, you know, the infrared camera. The idea was you do an uh, investment grade audit of a home or a building. You know, this is kind of this was going to be the next big thing for energy back in 2008. And in 2000, uh, uh, September 2008 uh, or November, uh, Barack Obama was elected, and that was part of his, you know, his whole. And that the oil was 140 bucks a barrel, I think, at that point. And, you know, March of 2009, oil was like 35 bucks a barrel. And nobody was spending money on, oh, yeah, let's put $10,000 in insulation in our house. Well, you've got to be kidding me. I, I don't even know if I'm going to have my house, in, 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 and they'll pay back in 10 years or whatever. So this whole business, just, just no one's made money in that business. The, the only people that have done well, I think, like McKinstry or those kind of guys that do it for a whole college campus, where they manage the whole campus, there's been some energy. Because you have to have scale, sophistication. It has to be a big, like Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, for instance, their whole campus. They have the whole, uh, they do energy retrofitting, but it's, yeah. Okay, and then, um, anyway, these are a couple other ones. And this I can talk about the oil company. This is an ice company. This was a, a, a boiler thing. I, um, and this is a recent company that I, I, I was involved with. It didn't work. Here's one that has worked. I started a, a company called Sterling Ultra Cold. And uh, it uses free piston Sterling uh, uh, refrigeration system. And we're doing 20 million in sales. I'm, I was chairman of the board of this when we started that. And it's in Ohio, and now we're going to do 40 this year. So it might, might get an, one exit. So this is this angel investment stuff. You know, we have one, if you got one thing that hits and, and nine don't, well, that one has to be at least 10x, so, or maybe 20x. Otherwise, you're, well, why are you spending your time and money? So this angel investing is a very difficult business. I mean, some people have done well in it, but I, I haven't. So I got my team, tribing, this is me racing. And then, you know, we've talked about this before, but uh, when, Thomas talked to me, you know, this idea of, of the most important the asset, the most precious asset in our, our business is the relationship we have with customers. And uh, at the end of the day, people buy from people. You know, you might get a good internet inquiry, but at the end of the day, people that trust you, they're going to trust you, they're going to buy from you. But you're not, if you don't have trust, it's going to be pretty tough to build a business. Uh, that's me with a couple of guys as we sold it. Um, you know, so then examine your life. Why am I doing this? You know, if you're going to start a business, is, what's the legacy you're going to leave and all that. Uh, this is me and my three sons. They're doing, they're doing really well. I'm building a house right now. I want to build a house. That's a picture of it. Uh, I want to build a house that will last 400 years. And by that, you got to build something good. It's going to be built out of steel, and, and I'll show you a picture. It's actually being built right now. That's actually, yeah, that's pretty cool. That's interesting. It photos. That's the actual, how it is right now. And uh, I got a chance to design parts of it. This is like my design for the, the plinth. And uh, so there's, there's what you need to ask yourself, you know, why are you doing it? And it's, it, it, it can't be just, some people say just to make money, I don't think that that's really it. And, but if you don't, you know, have resources coming in and, and, and all that, it's, you can't sustain it. So that's my story and I'm delighted to be here and I'd love to help anybody here that, have, that, that, that needs help or thinks they need help. And so, I guess questions? Yes. So in all your, um, all the ventures that you said failed, what was the one thing that you can probably take away from all of them that was like, that happened? Yeah. Like I, the one common thing between all of them. Could you I, repeat the question? Yeah, okay. So, oh, so I would ask um, what was the one common thing in yeah. all those failures? Mm -hmm. I think, um, <clears throat> you know, and that's a good, really good question, and nobody's ever asked me that question, so I'm a, my first thing that comes to mind is, number one, <clears throat> I didn't know enough about it, you know? I didn't really, I didn't, I didn't have as deep an understanding. I mean, I really understood the gas thing. I'd been in the industry, you know, I knew where the problems were. I knew the, I knew the, I knew the industry, I knew the pitfalls, right? Um, so, number one, I didn't have, I would say that's it. Just not have, in fact, again, it goes right back to the other question. Like, what should you spend your life doing? The thing you know the most about. Because that's the thing you have the most passion for. So, I, I you know, I'd see these projections. Like, I invested one, it was like a, an energy drink. I did one, a fruit picking thing. Why? Because a friend of mine was doing it. 
I did one on, you know, some sort of like ice for preserving fish. I got even <clears throat> into a yoga retreat thing. I mean, you know, I mean, I got into all kinds of stuff. It just, it isn't inside the wheelhouse. So I would say stick to the knitting, you know. And so I got involved with this thing called Karetsu Forum. Do you know what that is? <sighs> so I, I remember one, time, one of the Karetsu meetings was like 100 guys out there, gals, and they said, hey, who in this room's ever made any money on an angel investment? Of course, the guy that was running the meetings cringed, right? And no hands. Well, I guess, well, I made something back in, in 1999. I, I owned a, uh, I, we had a domain name called home, you know, homerealestate.com, and we sold it and we made money. But, you know, I, I don't know very many people who've made money in angel investing. And, and, you know, there's a lot of time and energy spent on that business. And it's, uh, it's uh, so I would say, you know, f knowledge. Now that you're a non-compete stuff, are you going to go pursue your own side? I, I'm doing a little bit of that, yeah. Uh, I started this new company called BioVault Northwest. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not really a kind of person who can work, work for somebody else. I guess I've learned that about myself. I mean, I'm unemployable, you know. <laughs> <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying? And uh, so I tried to start a new company, and it turns out that the person I brought on like, to, to run, help run the company, she was a hospital administrator, and she was very, very sophisticated, but you know, she never signed the front side of a paycheck, you know, always the back side, and so didn't really understand like, the nitty-gritty of running a business. And so to get back in, I either got to go start from scratch, another 10-year grind, which, you know, it's, it's a grind. I mean, you can see all those notes and stuff. And, uh, I mean, it's 7 by 24, you know, uh, for every day. And I'd be carrying a beeper, and, you know, we're going to have a, a response. They don't have beepers oh, they don't have beepers? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe that's my problem. I, I, I didn't get the memo. On it. I'm still, I got a beeper on right here, don't I? <laughs> I always feel at home with a beeper, you know. Like I, it's sort of like, you know, spectacles, watch and wallet kind of thing, you know. Spectacles, beeper, watch and wallet. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I think I have. I, I've, I've actually reached out to them socially, you know, and I'm doing a little bit of mentoring and that kind of thing. Amazing thing is some of our employees have done incredibly well. And uh, one of them, a guy who I put through college, uh, he actually runs a $250 million division for a company called Westco now. It's an electrical supply company. Another guy started as a driver with me. I put several guys through college and gals, and uh, we had a female production manager, chemistry degree, female uh, CFO, female, and it's an industrial business. You don't see a lot of that, you know. It's, it's kind of like B two B. It's kind of like you know trucks and stuff, you know. And um, so yeah, I've I've, uh, I've I've reached out to them socially and tried to get together and had a little bit of a birthday party, but I, I you know. That's one of the problems. I, I don't. I don't really want to go back into the thing because I'd be working. This. Air Gas was just acquired by Air Liquide, a big French company. So there's going to be an opportunity in the business. And, you know, somebody could do it, but you know, I don't want to. Again, why would I? You know, to repeat success. But I, I do want to be friends with my tribe and you know that that kind of thing. Any more questions? Yes. So it kind of sounds like uh, some of the organizations you've built and you've, you've kind of come full circle and learned. It sounds like. It's an extension of yourself. Yeah. Like the, the, the company you make is a, an expression of who you are. Yeah, exactly. Um, so today, do you feel like you know who you are? You're still exploring? <laughs> I mean, it, it sounds yeah. like, you know, what's my wheelhouse? No, no. I, I, I actually, I, I am at a loss on that a little bit. Yeah, because, you know, I mean, I, I've got my kids launched. I'm building this house, but it's not, not enough just to build a house. I mean, I can, I'm interested in cycling. I rode across Mongolia last year. It took me six weeks to go from Beijing to Russia. And so I, I still like exploration, but you know, I, I, uh, I, I am, I was going to do this BioVault thing, and then just until about a month ago, when my partner uh, and I weren't able to work it out, she didn't have any money, and she didn't have the experience, and she wanted a big salary, and we didn't have any customers, and you know, I was looking at you know, quarter million dollars before you even get going, I, and I realized that you know, then I've got to be there doing it anyway. Um, so yeah, I'm, I, I do have some bandwidth for that right now, and and. Uh, We'll see, but I am out exploring that right now. I've got a career counselor guy I meet with once a month or once a well, every couple of weeks, and and we're working on, a, on the new the plan new you know post bio vault right, but yeah it's it's uh, it's a journey. I mean it isn't like I get up in the morning and I, you know I do want to have a, a sense of purpose and meaning in my life, and I, I do have energy and I do have resources, and I I want to be not just coasting. Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, and. Uh, I don't know if I'll ever get, you know, I, I think maybe that's the point is that you, it, it's always changing, you know. Your sense of self is changing. Your age is changing. Your economic situation is changing. Your, you know, money doesn't really motivate me so much, you know. 
and or the, the idea of building a business from scratch and proving I damn the torpedoes I did it. You know, I've, I've done it. I know I can do it again. I can maybe, but you know, I'm 65. It's another 20, 25 years. I mean, do what, what, you know, I should be doing something else with it maybe. So the DNA of what we learned, you know, I, <coughs> that still is around in the people. Air gas totally tore the plant down and ripped it out. It's gone. They got rid of the brand. One, one year to the date after I sold it, they painted all the trucks and they, they promised me they weren't, but they did. Well, you know, I went to saw my professor. I said, well, what about, you know, burn special gases, live forever, and I'll be part of it, you know, all this kind of thing. And he said, well, wait a minute. Now, didn't they buy the company? I said, yeah, so they own it, right? And they, did they pay you? I said, they pay me. He said, well, well you, you, you've got no say in it. You know, it's their thing. They can do whatever they want with it. And including, you know, getting rid of you as a competitor and an employee. I mean, they didn't really fire me. They just didn't make it very much fun, you know. And, uh, and that's how it is with big companies, so. Well, thank you, Dan. I appreciate yeah. your time. It, it, <laughs> <laughs> All right.